On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, 16 companies control 80% of the world's liner shipping, container production, and box leasing capacity. How many of them are American-owned? The answer is not good. I'm your host, Sal McCagliano. I'm the chair of the Department of History, Criminal Justice, and Political Science at Campbell University, former Merchant Mariner, and I teach courses in maritime history, maritime security, and maritime policy. So this story came out the other day in Freight Waves, and I thought it's a great one. Greg Miller, once again, came out with this story uh, concerning the ownership and consolidation of the global supply chain. And it follows on the heels of several other stories, one I've mentioned and one I'm working on right now. So let's go ahead and head over to them. So the story I'm working on probably for this weekend is going to be this one right here. G Captain published the White House fact sheet on the Biden-Harris action plan for America's ports and waterways. Basically, how they're going to spend part of that infrastructure, the $17 billion that is earmarked for ports and waterways, how they have that kind of figured out and how they're going to plan it. And it breaks it down. And I'm going to spend some time breaking down each of these issues here and what is these projects are aiming to do and what are they missing at this point? Because there's a lot to see in this, this basically fact sheet that they put out. Uh, I will tell you that I, I think we need to invest in, in port infrastructure, but one of the areas that they're not talking about here is in ownership of key elements of the supply chain. So yesterday I talked to, I uh, had a story that, I, that uh, or day before I put a story out on this, uh, talking about U.S. regulators balk at billion dollar takeover of Ports America. And I received very many notes from Canadians who, who again, I love Canada, absolutely adore Canada. Uh, Canada, you're, 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 you're my second favorite nation behind the United States. But this is an attempt by Canada to purchase, particularly the, the, the Canadian uh, uh, pension fund, to take over the Ports America in the United States. And again, th this is not new. Uh, let me be clear. Uh, American ports have been purchased and, and leased by foreign companies for a long time. I did another video where, you know, excuse me, it was in that same video where I talked about the, the seven container terminals in LA. And I talked about the fact that while the, the ports owned by the city of LA, it, LA is the landlord, the seven terminals are leased out to Maersk, uh, to uh, MSC, to Japanese companies, uh, to CMA CGM, which is just trying to, to buy out Fenix right now, and to Ports America, Yang Min's in there, uh, China Holding is in there. But again, the idea of foreign ownership of the supply chain isn't really new. But in this story, Greg goes a step up. Greg, Greg took this up to 11, where he talked about it. And in, in fact, he talks about the fact that 16 companies control 80% of the world's liner shipping, container production, and box lease box leasing capacity. I want to break that down a little bit because actually I think he undersells some of the elements that are in here. So in this first element of the story right here, uh, he, he's talking about this, that U.S. policymakers have never been more focused on global container shipping than they are today, yet the steel of this industry, the ships uh, and the containers are really kind of being, you know, all this is outside U.S. control. And, and that is the issue that I keep coming back to. It's great that the FMC is worried about Canada taking over Ports America, but they're not worried about these other elements. And, and I think that's a big issue that's being missed in this. And, and Greg kind of uh, highlights this in here. He goes in here, talks about a couple of things, and, and really what he comes down to is here is the very end. Add it all up, and it equates to a grand total of just 16 companies, eight liners. These are eight shipping companies. And again, I think he undersells that. I would have focused on nine of them that control nearly 85% of the ocean shipping, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Three factory groups which produce the containers and five box lessers that control over 80% 80, 80 of the container ship capacity, box production capacity, and box leasing capacity. Shareholders of each of these 16 companies would benefit financially if today's high prices persist. This is the other element that we keep missing right here, is there is no incentive for the ocean carriers, for the box manufacturers, and the box lessers to see the situation change. I, I, I mean, we keep hearing about the ocean carriers. They, you know, we, we want to lower rates. They don't. Look at the third quarter profits coming in. HMM, 
made record profits. Hop Hog is going to make record profits. Uh, ONE, record profits. Maersk, record profits. All these companies are making record profits. Again, why, why would you sit there and sit there and say, you know what, <laughs> it's, it's too much money. Please stop. Nobody says that. No, no one ever wins the lottery. It says, you know, this is too much money. I, I don't want it all. This is not what's happening. So let's break down Greg's story here. So one of the first things he does is he talks about ocean carrier consolidation. And I'm going to come over here to ocean carrier consolidation and get my mug off the screen because you don't need to see my mug for this. But he talks about these, the top eight carrier groups and their share of the global fleet. And this is something that we've, we've, I've talked about quite a bit. And usually what I will say is the top nine or 10 ocean carriers control 85% of the, uh, of the ocean fleet. Here he has it just the top eight. I'm going to actually show this chart right here which is, uh, I think, a great one. This is done by Alcock Global. This is back in June, where they go into Alpha Liner and they look at all the big ocean carriers. And, and one of the things you see here are, are the ocean carriers and the amount of containers they have. And if you look at this, this shows you the, the top uh, 10 right here, all the way down the one high. These guys control 85% of the world's container ocean container uh, traffic. And you'll see right here next to them, the flags of their countries. You know, Maersk is Denmark, MSC is Swiss, Costco is China, CMA CGM is France, Hapag Lloyd is Germany, uh, ONE is a conglomeration there, Japan, HMM is Korea, Evergreen, Yangmin, Wanhai, all Taiwanese. But what's even more disturbing about this is, is number one, is you see the uh, percentages these, these companies carry but what's not always talked about that needs to be talked about is these, the top nine here, except for one high, are all in these huge, massive alliances. So if you've witnessed what's happened in container shipping, if you've ever read Mark Levinson's The Box, which is a great book, it takes you up to 2006. The most recent edition has an ending chapter. It takes you up to about 2015. But what we've seen happen since 2015 is really consolidation in these big lines, but these alliance systems have come into play. So for example, Maersk and MSC, they're in what's called the 2M alliance. Their alliance is probably one of the most powerful. I mean, you're talking about them controlling over 8 million container slots. And not only that, MSC is under this huge kick right now of ordering and purchasing ships. They're going to eclipse Maersk very shortly here and become the biggest container liner out there. Then you have the Ocean Alliance, which is Costco, CMA, CGM, and Evergreen, which is, which is a strange alliance. You have a, a, a People's Republic of China, France, and then Republic of China all together in this second biggest alliance. And then the, the third alliance, which is the smallest of the three, but still significant, is the alliance. That's ONE, that's Yangmin, that's HMM, and that's Hop Hog Lloyd. And these liners are basically cartels. They can control rates. And one of the things we're going to see that happens here, and this is the big issue that's going to happen, is that when things even begin to slow down, we're not going to see rates plummet to the way they were pre-COVID. Because now the container companies, which were in these alliances before, but they were really scrounging for, for, for market share, will now realize, okay, listen, we can blank sale, we can stop sailing vessels, we can basically control ocean shipping. And one of the things we're going to see them do is, is, is play a much more heavy-handed game right here. If you look right here in the order book, CMA CGM's order to fleet ratio is 17%. Uh, HMN, the Costco, 20%. ONE, 21%. Hop Hog Lloyd, 23%. Uh, uh, Maersk is only at 6%, but Evergreen's at 48%. They're, they're ordering ships like crazy, and they're ordering big monster vessels, uh, ever ace size, 24,000, 25,000 boxes, but a lot of mid-range Neo Panamax that can go through the Panama Canal, 14 to 15,000 sized vessels. And one of the things that's going to happen when this all begins to slow down is they're going to start scrapping their older fleet. A lot of vessels are running that don't need to be running. They, they, they've got older engines, older technology. They're going to scrap them. They're going to recycle them. I shouldn't say scrap because, because one of the things that the uh, ocean carriers have learned is how to recycle vessels very effectively. And what you've seen here is over the past few years, and Greg notes it here, is how these companies have basically bought each other out. Maersk bought Hamburg Sud. Costco merged with China Shipping, bought OOCL. Hop Hog Glide with CSAV. 
bought CCNI, acquired a United Arab Shipping Company, CMA C CGM bought APL, uh, ONE is the merging of three Japanese lines, the K line, NYK, and MOL. And then Hanjin was driven out of business in 2016. And as, as Lars Jensen, who I think is one of the smartest people in the maritime sector, as he notes here, we have definitely seen the effects of consolidation, at least on the main trades. There is a de facto oligar oligarchy, which means the carriers are able to somewhat better prevent the price wars we've seen in the past. This is the logical end of 20 years of gradual consolidation. Go back 15 years, the top 10 companies controlled 50% of the container capacity. Today, the top 10 can carry uh, control over 85%. And the top nine of those are in three massive alliances that can target the smaller firms, run them out of business, or begin to target each other. And then you'll have a massive war between the alliances. So that's the first part he looks at. So, And again, all those companies are gone. Maersk consumed Sealand, which had been the largest U.S. shipping firm. APL, which had been a massive American firm, was bought up by NOL and consumed by CMA, CGM. And U.S. lines was was deregulated out of business when we deregulated the shipping industry. We allowed it to basically go away. And now the U.S. finds itself without a major shipping line in international trade. All the major ones that we operate today are subsets of them, Maersk, Hophog, and CMA, CGM. Matson, which is the closest to a large American line, is small. It, 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 I think it's, it's in the top 20, but, but not very high up there. They handle mainly uh, West Coast of Hawaii, Alaska, some Far East, but not a lot. The second element here is container manufacturing consolidation. So this is the chart right here. Oops, sorry, it went too far right there. It's actually this one. There we go. Uh, this is the uh, uh, container uh, fabrication, who basically fabricates uh, containers. And you'll see right here, CMIC group, uh, CIMC group, excuse me, Dongfang, and then CXIC, all of them are basically controlling this. They control over 84% of container manufacturing. And if you look at this section of the report right here, they go in here, they talk about the dominance of the top three is increasing. Don, uh, Don Fang hiked its capacity in 2019 by purchasing factories uh, from one of the smaller players. And it goes in here to talk about this. All of them are Chinese. All of them are uh, mainland China that control those three. So nearly all boxes are built in China. Uh, they're producing record numbers. Uh, uh, if you look right here, the... Uh, 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 Textiner predicted that, that production would exceed 6 million TEUs, while container equipment lesser Triton estimated around 5.4. Even so, China's top three are, are protecting their pricing, not flooding the market with excess containers. The cost of a new container remains at an all-time high, around $3,800 per 20-foot equivalent unit. So they're not flooding the market. We know that there's empty containers in the United States that need to get out. They can't be repositioned quickly enough. Uh, and so China is building containers, but they don't want to flood the market with it. So they're they're controlling this. And you see China dominate this. The top three control nearly 84%, 83.3% of container production. And then you come to the last element here, which is container leasing. Where do you get your containers from? Now, understand, in the past, this had been done almost entirely by the ocean carriers. If you've seen containers on vessels going up and down roads, you've seen the names of the big ocean carriers on the side, Maersk, APL, uh, uh, Costco, Hopog. You'll, you'll see them all, Yangmin, you'll see it all the time. And you'll see containers off in fields for constructions and they're, they're just sitting there. But that's changed. The, 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 the big carriers got out of this business. And as you see right here, the top five box leasers now control 82% of that leasing capacity, 82% uh, of that leasing capacity. And once again, none of these leasers are American. All of them are overseas. When you start looking at them right here, Bermuda Docile uh, Textaner is in second with 18%. Uh, Bermuda Docile Triton is the largest with 25%. So Bermuda is controlling <laughs> the, 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 the container leasing. And, and you're gonna be asked why Bermuda, it's, it's, it's offshore, it's taxes, it's corporations, it's cheaper. 
That's why they do it. Next in line uh, uh, at 14% is Florence, which is owned by Chinese Costco. That's the Chinese overseas shipping company. And with uh, along with 14% and also with 14%, the combined holdings of CIA and Beacon. Beacon is owned by uh, Japanese Mitsubishi C Capital. Uh, and, and then you look at Seco, which is owned by China's HNA. So, I, I mean, you're, you're looking at Bermuda, Japan, China controlling this. And they're the ones controlling that market. Uh, they're controlling the leasing. And with China controlling the manufacturing, with the ocean shipping being in the hands of top nine companies in three massive alliances, the United States finds itself really at the whim of these foreign companies. Now, we can make the argument, hey, this is, this is the free capital system. This is, the, this is what we wanted. When we deregulated ocean shipping with the Shipping Act of 1984 and the Ocean Reform Act of 1998, this is what we wanted. And we benefited from it. We got really cheap shipping. We got cheap transportation. We got goods flowing into the United States at really lo low levels. You know, look at the video I did about, you know, how, how pairs flow from Argentina to Thailand to Washington, D.C. You know, we want that. We want low transportation cap, uh, costs because then we can get cheap goods from overseas. The problem with that now is we're paying the, the long term impact of that. And one of the things we're seeing is all of this is out of our hands. We have literally almost no control about it when the FMC makes this balk about Canada buying Ports America, understand this is the, the only thing they can get their hands on to talk about. We've already seen most ports, the terminals at least, being taken over by foreign companies. It's, it's just the way it is. APM, Maersk, is one of the biggest terminal operators in the world. We've seen that. Ports America was, was created to prevent Dubai, Dubai uh, World from, from doing that because we got worried about the Middle East owning our ports. But no one paid attention right afterwards as other countries came in and bought terminals in New York, New Jersey, all around the United States. We didn't care. But now the FMC has got its hackles up because Canada, and once again, I will say it, Canada is the threat the FMC sees. Where are they in looking at the fact that again, 82, or excuse me, let's go with this, 82% of container leases are all overseas. 83.3% of box production is all in China. And the top eight carriers control over 81%. Again, I don't know why we did top eight. I, I would have gone top nine myself because that's about 85% when you throw in Yang Min in there. Uh, and then you also have uh, uh, one high. And the other guy I throw in there is Zim. Actually, top 11. If you look at the top 11, they're pretty powerful. But the top nine are in those alliances. But we'll go with Greg. Top eight. Uh, you see this right here. And all of this is outside US control. Again, do we care about this? Do we care if shipping is, is outside our control? Do we care if the world shipping lines, the container production and block leasing is out of our capacity? Most Americans don't. As long as I'm getting my cheap goods, I'm getting cheap consumer goods, it's fine. But the thing I come back to is if the U.S. considers itself a maritime power, can you be a maritime power when you have the number one Navy in the world, which depends on how you count it now, because China just eclipsed the U.S. Navy in terms of numbers of ships, uh, but your merchant marine is number 21 in the world, whereas China is number two in both. And Costco is the single largest commercial shipping line in the world when you look at all of its assets, not just containers, tankers, and everything else that, that, that's with it. And I think this needs to be addressed. The problem is this, the action plan that the White House put out here for America's ports and waterways, looks at ports and waterways, does not look at ocean transportation, does not look at the American merchant marine, does not look at whether or not the US should have a domestic fleet that can be used to carry parts of its imports and exports. You know, I, I did a video about the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. And one of the things I call that was America's first national maritime strategy. And, and again, I argue all the time that we need a new national maritime strategy because the, the Jones Act, as it's called, that everybody attacks repeatedly. One element in that was the coastal trade, but there was many other acts of that that all that all basically made up 
the Merchant Marine Act of 1920 that were key to creating a national maritime strategy. What we've done over time is slowly whacked off pieces of it. We've basically disassembled it. And now what's left of it, the remnants of it is this cabotage, this coastal trade act that people focus on. But what we need to look at is whether we need a new national maritime strategy or else are we comfortable with 80% of our supply chain being controlled by elements outside the United States. And I will tell you for most people, they're fine with it because all they look at is the bottom dollar. But as we're seeing right now, short-term benefit can net you long-term problems. And that's what we're seeing. So hope you enjoyed the episode. Hope you got something out of the episode. Uh, if you did, please subscribe to the channel. Please share it across social media. Give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment. I'm sure I've, I've created some uh, commentary out there. Feel free to leave it. We're getting great commentary by people, people who know very little about the maritime industry, people who are in the maritime industry and want to contribute, people who are in the maritime industry and don't want you to know they're in the maritime industry and who they are are contributing. Uh, we're getting people across the board. Literally, it was at my dentist's office today. And my dentist said he was talking to his sister in Colorado and said, I saw this great YouTube about the global shipping issue by a guy named Sal, which I kind of floored me right there that, that my dentist's sister in Colorado. And if you're watching, hello, uh, your brother's a great dentist. Uh, I'm really shocked by it. We're over 26,000 subscribers. We're increasing, uh, you know, almost a thousand subscribers every week. Uh, I'm floored by it. I'm, I'm humbled by it. And I hope you appreciate the effort and, and work we put into this. And uh, if you enjoy it, again, please like it, please subscribe, please, you know, if you can donate to Patreon to, I, I need to work on a new camera, I've been told. So my camera's a little blurry. So I apologize about that. And I'm learning as I go along. Sorry, was not educated in how to do a YouTube broadcast. Anyway, this is Sal. Till our next episode, sign off.